Now, let's just take it back to this um, description of kind of where we are in the industrial real estate area. You describe that as the seventh inning, and some people might construe that to be, oh, we're near the end. You know, is, is the type of growth that we've seen historically sustainable, given that we're not in the third inning, we're in the seventh inning? And, you know, talk about that, you know, maybe in kind of releasing spreads and, you know, the, the challenges that you might be seeing um, to bring on more space in specific markets. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think in each uh, overall market, i.e. the U.S., Canada, Europe, Western Europe, you, you have to look at those independently. And I think that we do. So, for example, let's look at Toronto. So, to me, the story of Toronto is international immigration. So, every individual uses or needs an average of 80 square feet of storage space a year. So if you're adding 120,000, 125,000 new um, Ontarians uh, by virtue of Toronto, new Torontonians every year because of international immigration, that means you need roughly 10 million square feet of absorption. And that's, that's exactly what we've seen in Toronto every year for decades, right? And so because of that immigration, and even in 2008, 2009, 2010, we literally had 100 million square feet or roughly 80 million square feet of vacancy and then supply stopped. And it is one of the great regulating factors of our industry. There, there never can really be oversupply. Um, there can be short term, but it's really not, it's not a structural issue because uh, new supply just stops. As soon as there's oversupply, it, it just stops. And again, on the flip side, as soon as rents get out of hand, supply picks up and it does regulate that growth. It's a very defensive asset class. But what we saw in 2010 to recently in Toronto is the vacancy went from 80 million square feet to 70 to 60. So it was like that 10 to 12 million feet. Now with the commerce and really it, this is about the expectations of the consumer. If you want something delivered same day, there has to be a lot more storage to accommodate that requirement than if you are willing to wait a week or two weeks for it. So that 10 million square feet that Toronto was averaging, now it's 15 to 20 million feet. So it adds a 50% or higher amount of demand concentration on those markets. When we look at the US, it's not so simple in my mind. So we try and identify markets where we see growth, where we see population growth, where we see demographic shifts, where we see business growth, and where we see evolving supply chain nodes. And for example, that's why a lot of our assets are in the Midwest. It's that proximity to labor, proximity to cargo airports, to rail, to highway infrastructure, and most importantly, it can get to a large part of the population in the U.S. within a day's drive. So the Louisvilles, the Columbuses, the Cincinnati's, they all have those common features, and that's why those markets have done so well, and that's why we're, we're in those markets. So you have to identify. Once you go to Europe, again, it's different. There are no major industrial markets per se in Europe. There's no L.A., in Europe. There's no Chicago as a market in Europe. It's just a, a collection of smaller markets. So for us, it's really about the supply chain corridor. The most critical one goes from Rotterdam to the Mediterranean. And that also crosses the highest concentration of population almost in the world. So it goes through that swath, at least in Europe, I would say. And that's where we feel we're going to have the most success because that's going to remain the most critical distribution corridor once e-commerce um, becomes more mainstream in, in mainland Europe. So we approach it differently, Dean, between, between markets, but we're looking for those sort of common characteristics in those markets, which we think are going to drive our growth.